Good evening, everyone. Um, the title of today's panel is Technology and Venture Capital Roundtable. So our, moderate, our moderator for today is Matt Brazina, a 2003 graduate of Penn State Schreier's Honors College. Um, he's one of the most successful entrepreneurs of Penn State, founding multi-million dollar companies, including Sincerely and Zobni. And today, Matt is a venture capitalist with investments in more than 80 startups. So he also supports Invent Penn State programs as a donor, mentor, and advisor. Please help me welcome Matt Brazina. How's this mic working? Yeah, cool. All right. Is Jason here yet? We're waiting on one of our other panelists. Um, let's see if this is going to work. Yeah, this will work. OK, let's bring up um, our panelists. and. Jason's not here, but Tom, Chevy, Eric, please come on up. Thank you guys. Okay, cool. Um, so everybody up here is a Penn State grad. I've just gotten to know Eric uh, recently, both having you know kind of come from similar backgrounds, sold companies, turned into venture capitalists, and then Tom and Chevy are founders that I backed. Uh, invested in their companies and, and have helped both of them for Chevy for four years and Tom for two and a half or three. And then Jason, come on up as well. Um, Jason's also a new friend, uh, a venture capitalist, uh, and um, yeah, just kind of now getting engaged back in the uh, Penn State entrepreneurship community. Yeah. So uh, what I wanted to do today was I've got some specific questions for uh, you know, the two founders in the panel, as well as the two investors. But I want to start by everyone just getting context to your background. So maybe, Eric, if you can start, tell us what year you graduated, what your, yeah, what your career path looked like, what you're doing now, what's your focus? Absolutely. Um, you here? No. Press the button. Tessa. There you go. Okay. Uh, hey, everybody. Thanks, uh, thanks Matt. Um, Eric Franchi. Graduated uh, 98, so that was 25 years ago, amazingly. Um, after graduation, I graduated with a degree in marketing from Smeal. Um, sort of uh, found my way in the world for a couple of years, uh, fell in love with the internet um, when it was somewhat still in its infancy, dove in, uh, started working at internet companies and ultimately uh, started one which was an early version of an ad network business. Um, ad networks are you know, sort of businesses that sit in the middle of uh, ad sellers and ad buyers. Uh, Google runs the largest one. Um, that turned into my entire career, effectively. We did that for 15 years. Um, and uh, it was acquired in late 2015 by a publicly traded company. Uh, I left and started a venture capital fund, which uh, specializes in that sector that I know quite well, which is advertising and marketing technology, and I've uh, been doing that for five years. Cool. Jason. Thank you. I'm Jason Warner, and I am one year younger than Eric, it would appear. So thankfully, thanks, thanks for being the oldest person up here for me. Um, I graduated Penn State in 99, computer science, um, mostly hung around startups my entire career, and what I'm probably most well known for is being the CTO at GitHub. So two years pre-Microsoft acquisition, then two years post-Microsoft acquisition. Um, and at GitHub, um, you know, products you may have used that I incubated there were um, GitHub Actions, Packages, Advanced Security, and then the latest one, GitHub Copilot. And before that, other startup companies, Heroku and uh, Canonical, people make Ubuntu Linux. So mostly the exact opposite of the marketing side of the world, which is dev infrastructure and big distributed systems. And, and now today you're investing at? I'm investing at Redpoint. Great. Uh, yes, yeah, so I graduated in 14. Um, after graduating, well, prior to graduating, I kind of got an experience uh, working on a startup and uh, really fell in love with it. I studied telecommunications and um, after college, kind of did a solo project, um, then worked at a big company, learning sales, and then I implemented those skills at a, at a drone company, um, selling to telecommunication companies, and, uh, and, and found a problem set that Gizual solves, which I work at today, and what we do is we um, we solve outages for telecommunication companies. So we we provide global um, infrastructure intelligence for these companies. I'm, I'm Chevy. I'm a 2019 graduate. I was a biology pre med major, 
Um, and I kind of fell in love with startups when I went to Launchbox one day and just met with Lee and met with Jason. And I met two others here who are on the co-founding team. We were originally working on some project, won like $30,000 in just free money here. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> he spearheaded a lot of those programs. We used that money to move out to San Francisco, eventually pivoted to diagnostics um, for animals. So if you have like a dog or a cat, you get some blood work done. That's what we specialize in. And we've grown, I think in the last 12 months, we did about 60,000 tests and we've been, we've been growing. So I've got uh, specific questions for each of you, um, some for the investor side, some for the founder side. Maybe Chevy, we can start with you. Um, when I think about your business, I, I think timing is really important. So I'd like to explore that a little bit with you. In, in particular, like I don't think, or my guess would be Moicor probably wouldn't have been started in 2010 or 2015. So can you tell us a bit about like how you're leveraging technology to deliver better um, results and value for your customers and what, what technology you're using and why now? Yeah, I think it's a technology play, but also there's a significant market play where our timing was good too. So in terms of the technology, I mean, we use a lot, a lot of power um, when it comes to processing these samples. Um, so for instance, let's say you bring a dog or a cat in and one of the most common diagnostics is called the complete blood count. So you're looking at like your red blood cells and white blood cells. I believe it's run more than 100 million times in the United States, just, just on pets. And so basically what we're doing for all of those samples is we're collecting these images and we're tagging all the cells. So every sample that comes through Moicor, we're producing 300 to 500 data points. And every month we're getting about 50, well, it grows about you know 10%, but we're getting 5,500 of those samples. So it's an enormous amount of data that we have to store. Um, not only that, when it comes to the market, COVID did help us, um, you know, because those labs, they, uh, our competitors use very traditional methodology, and so they got bombarded with samples. And whereas we use a lot more software, so we were able to, you know, keep our turnaround times, which is when a vet submits a sample to Moicor, they want the results in a certain period of time. And so using our software and our AI, we're able to do better on that stuff. Can I ask you your... So to be very clear, what they do is they um, they capture images of these blood samples and then apply um, machine learning to those to, to try to answer these questions about how many of what cell exists in a in a sample. Those algorithms that you're using, uh, I assume a lot of them are open source. Yeah. W you know, were those available ten years ago, or no, was the no. compute available to? <laughs> no. Yeah, that's all all recent. Um, and so, yeah, I talked to Tang about this quite frequently. Um, so Tang is also Penn State. He came from the graduate of ISD. Um, he was like a machine learning PhD. And so five or six years ago, this would be really, really difficult to do um, for the reasons that Matt's saying. Um, so Chevy's one of my, the investments I've made in the last six months. I was talking to one of my investors, one of the people that gives me money and about the work that I was doing recently. and. I noticed that four of my last five investments are involve uh, computer vision and machine learning. Hmm. And so I, I, you know, I kind of get involved early and I bet on just incredible people like the founders up here. Um, but then these kind of patterns pop out where it's like, wow, a lot of the best people are leveraging this, this new wave of technology. And I, I think this is an area where, you know, we are much like the AI conversation that you're seeing online, we're, we're seeing this rapid change in what we can do um, with computer vision. Um, and so Moicor is a great example of a company leveraging that. Um, since you have the mic in your hand, let's, uh, let's hear a little bit um, from Jason about, uh, so the, Jason actually invests and it gets involved at the latest stage of the people up here. So it's still early, but you know, you're usually, like when you came into GitHub, how many employees were there? About 600 total. 600. Came into Heroku, how many employees? Uh, about 100. And now you're investing at a state. What's the profile of the company that you're investing in? Yeah, so Redpoint has two different funds. We call early and then early growth. So early is seed, pre-seed, uh, pre seed, and A. And then early growth is basically A, B, and some Cs. So we typically say that you know we'll, we'll do anything from um, your first check up to $100 million. But I will specifically focus on stuff that's usually about $20 million check plus. So if you think about a $20 million check, I usually write 300K checks. So very different scale. 
I'm curious about your, uh, well, how well and how much time do you get to spend with a founder before you go write a $20 million check? What is that, and what does your diligence process look like? Well, 2023 looks very different than 2021 in this regard. Um, so 2021, when I first started this, you didn't get time. You know, people were following on rounds super quickly. That was the height of the market, and it was not a great time. You didn't get to spend any time with people, and it was not a fun time to invest from my perspective. Now we get to spend time with, with folks, and particularly because of what I tend to focus on, what I do is I go find people who have just raised a seed or an A, and they're a founder building an infrastructure database or AI company. And I said, hey, do you, in the form of a CTO at GitHub, I built these things. Do you want to meet monthly and talk about your product strategy and vision and go to market motions, open source, freemiums, all that? And would that be valuable? And so I've done that. Um, I have recurring maybe seven or eight of these now. And I just continue to meet with them on a regular basis. And that's my little hack to, to meet with them as much as I possibly can. And in fact, I still do it with one that I regrettably wasn't able to invest in because the price got out of my range even, but like Hugging Face, if you know what that is from a, um, an AI perspective, which is, looks like a GitHub for AI. I spent time with Clem for over the course of a year and then the price just got way out of whack, but I still meet with him because he's building something interesting enough where I just want to hang out with him and talk about it. So you're meeting with seven, eight founders a month that you're not even an investor in yet. Right, but and then hoping some of these. I'm hoping some of them turn into it, and then you know some of them, some other folks less often, like every six weeks or every three months, and then of course the the people that Redpoint has invested, and in, I also do this for, right. and then my own investments, I'm doing it even more frequently. Right, cool. Yeah, Jason. Yeah, we got another question for Jason. <laughs> Is it more exciting or scary to write a twenty million dollar check? Um, Mike. You know, I don't think I know the difference. You know, so a $20 million check is like, oh, okay, it's, you know, it's a lot of money. Um, if it was a $20 million personal check, <laughs> but uh, which I don't have. So um, I, I think it, 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 because of the way that we process stuff, we feel good about it by that point. And there's enough traction in businesses and we feel great about it. But even so, when I have a, one partner, his name's Scott Rainey, he's a legendary investor. And he looks across the table and is like, are you certain this is going to be a big company? I was like, oh, why would you have to do uh, Yes. Is, as non-emphatically as I can possibly say that, and then you have to sweat it out for five years. But do you have analysts that are helping you? We do. We have. We have. Um, we're a, we're a small firm by Silicon Valley standards for big check sizes, but we still have analysts and principals. And so I work with three people on a regular basis. Between Scott and I, we have an infrastructure group, and we work with them. And we're we're pulling apart all these data rooms. We're analyzing the business. So we're doing Tika's calls, and we're doing all of the the data room analysis and TAM analysis, and we're talking to other venture investors and stuff. And so by the time we get to the point where we're investing, we, we know the business better than the entrepreneurs in most of these cases. We send them 70 page decks, which is like, here's your business, here's where we see it, here's where you're weak against the competition, all that sort of stuff. So we feel really good about it, but it's still scary to write that check. And especially because as a nuance to this, I can't technically sign when I'm in Canada because it violates international law. I have to actually fly to the US to sign the check. No. Yeah. Luckily, you're doing only like two a year. Yeah, that's, a, that's right. Jesus, that's funny. Um, Eric and I invest at a much different stage. Uh, you don't have analysts. No. Yeah, and I don't either. Um, so I, we, like, we, we really approach the business differently than what Jason's doing. Like, I do not send somebody a deck that, you know, I know your business better than you do. I just am kind of like, I think you're good. Um, cool. All right, let's go to Tom. So uh, I've been lucky to be an investor in Tom's company for two years. Um, and Tom, the thing that's really impressive to me is you've sold multi-million dollar contracts to some of the largest companies in America. And I'm curious, especially for this group, they would probably love to hear, like, what surprised you the most about getting a big company to trust your little 10-person startup? Surprised me the most. I think that you can you can be really great at something if you just focus on like who you are and boil it down, right? So it's like it's like you you have this big idea on the product you want to build, but what is like for us it was important to realize that like we can build something insanely valuable if we just really really focus down and make it like um, 
as focused as possible. I know that's kind of abstract, right? But but what I, what I how we do this, right, is we basically go in and we don't say, hey, you're going to rip and stitch this. You're going to take this system out and replace it with this system, because like you know, hard-earned people made those decisions. We come in and we say, hey, we have this really thin layer that's going to make everything run a little bit better, and um, and I think that was surprising that if you can really focus down uh, and just, yeah, it, it's a little bit abstract, but if you could really just focus down and, and get very specific, you could be like the only one in the world doing it, right? It's just like. I think you've done that really well. Um, could, you know, could you share any like learnings early on that informed how you build that product for those people or for those companies or how you craft the solutions that the customers are using today? Yeah, so, so one of the ways is basically you always want to show a visual. So you basically, show, like we would show presentations and say, okay, this is the problem, and talk through the problem with them. And then uh, after you talk through that problem, and you know, because you can solve maybe five problems, you then quantify that. So you talk, okay, here's the five things we can do, and then it's like a matrix, and then you quantify it based on... Um, Jason was alluding to with TAM, total addressable market, you say, okay, it's a really big pain, this market's massive, and they'll pay a lot. But in the early days, kind of how you can do these big deals is you don't focus on the center, you focus on the suites, like the corners. And in the corners, people can have really big pains and you can own a market really like well with a, a wedge product. And so it's, that's how I would recommend doing it. I, ca I kind of want to, um, let's see, it might bleed into my second question. So uh, if it's not clear, so Tom's company tells telecoms, hey, there is an outage in this location, this is why, yep. and it's gonna be back online in four hours. Your customer support team can make decisions around this, your field teams can make decisions around this, your business partners can make decisions around this. Um, and I, you know, I know the business pretty well, so I could tell the story. But um, basically, basically, this power data that you're getting—that was the wedge. Yeah, because exactly. you you didn't th that data already existed out there, but no one brought it all together. So talk about that a little bit. In a sense, so basically, what we did was, you know, what at a high level, what we were able to see was that there are a bunch of reasons why infrastructure goes down. It's just like like SaaS. Right? There's a bunch of reasons why your app's gonna crash. And there's a category, and then so you said, what's a category we can figure out here? And so what Matt's alluding to is we picked the one category where it was power, and with this power, we basically put stitched together a solution um, and, and delivered it to them. Yeah. But it was the power niche. But using publicly available data, like the power companies. Well, some, some of it, I mean, yeah, in a, in, a, in a sense, the one layer could be public, but not really. No, you're using, sorry to really get, but you're, you're also um, using third party sources of data too now. Yeah, exactly, like a little bit of AI, a little bit of mapping, yeah. Um, cool, all right, so let's go to Eric. Um, just getting to know you recently, I, you know, I learned that you're doing some what I would call pretty entrepreneurial venture investing. So not only, you know, is Eric and his co-founder finding the next great founder, they're just going to put money in. They're actually incubating ideas inside their venture fund and then spinning those out. So can you tell us a bit about how you come up with those ideas, maybe an example or two, and then how do they go from an idea to a business? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so th that's classically uh, incubation or acceleration, and that's a that's a business model unto itself. Y Combinator, which you, you went through, is the, the 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 best in the world at it. Um, we come at from the angle that uh, so we only invest in like one category. It's a giant category. It's the technology that you know sort of powers advertising and market and marketing. It's a trillion dollar global market. It's a six hundred billion dollar um, you know di digital ad market. So it's a really big market that's um, undergoing like a lot of disruption and creates opportunity. Um, so because we're so focused on one segment, because this is a segment we've built businesses in, because we're close to a lot of the action, 
oftentimes we see ideas that we'd love to uh, exist in the world as companies. Um, so what we will do is, uh, so we've got the capital somewhat covered in terms of the, uh, the capital to just get, get a business off the ground. Um, what we do is uh, you know, basically pitch our ideas to potential founders of the business. So um, it's the reverse of what happens to me all day long where people are pitching, pitching me on, on businesses. Um, we're, we're pitching people like, hey, we think this is an interesting idea. We think you know, this potentially could be something that you specifically could run with um, and, then, and then go from there. And what we will do is uh, you know, help them via our network of advisors and LPs who work in the space, but sort of love to you know, have some like, you know, part-time work they can jump into and potentially sort of run with um, for their next thing. Um, just start to create like a Voltron of people um, and then run down this idea, give it six months um, and then go from there. Uh, one example of this is, uh, so um, the, 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 the financial side of uh, the, the marketing world is completely uh, effed up. Um, there's like multiple uh, parties in the middle that um, uh, do a lot of lending and they charge high interest rates and ultimately like a dollar that a marketer will spend um, on their ads, like uh, something like 24% is just like wasted on all these like financial hops. So one of the businesses that we're working on is, um, you know, uh, effectively something that will just completely take all of that out. Um, so eliminate efficient inefficiencies yeah. in, the, in the system, give marketers, you know, sort of like more working dollars uh, towards their advertising, um, probably piss off a lot of people as a result, but if we do that, it's probably gonna be an enormous business. So you've been in venture for five years. How yeah. many of these have you done? Uh, we have done, we've done two of them so far, but through our careers, we sort of like came up with this model as, as a, as part of our, our day jobs. And both of those businesses, you know, are, are doing quite well. And I assume you were probably angel investing before you launched a venture fund. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what a lot of people will do. That's what I started doing. I just started investing in my smart friends that I couldn't hire. Um, yep. and, uh, you know, I, I think you guys are probably not far away from doing the same thing where you'll s start with just writing little checks into other great founders that you meet. Just make sure I meet them. <laughs> or if they're in, in advertising, make sure Eric meets them and then we'll have uh, Jason mark them up down the road. Um, all right, let's go back to Chevy. Scheme. Yes. And then we'll put it on the public markets. No. Um, uh, oh, Chevy, so can you tell us a bit about the evolution of your customers? We heard this morning about this first customer in Chicago. So some vet that took a bet on you guys. Tell, tell us you know, a bit about them. Um, and then you told me next week you have the CEO of a, that represents over 4,000 vet clinics coming to your office and your lab. So what's, what's that evolution look like? Um, what have you had to build to service those customers? Yeah. Um, so in, in the vet market, you have two types of customers, like independent clinics. These are your mom and pop shops that come. That's been our primary. Uh, we never even, that's been our primary customer um, until we raised a recent round. Um, and it became a focus to serve larger customers. So um, there's chains of veterinary clinics. I don't know if you heard of like VCA, Banfield. Um, those are actually all owned by one person. And so we started off in like the long tail of the market, which is not the sexy part of the market. They don't spend a lot of money, but they're willing to deal with you as a startup. And so we've been at it since pretty much 2019, and we've built up a product to the point where we're now able to go after these consolidators. Um, and when I say consolidator, it's someone who owns, you know, more than 20, 30 practices. Um, and so we, we have one in pilot right now. We have a few coming to visit us. Um, and so... It's been, we've just been chipping away at a product that will finally service them. And that's a much more lucrative market because, um, you know, like Redpoint likes enterprise level deals where there's a commitment of spend, you know, every year. And so, you know, we started off in a really not fun part of the market, but that's where you learn the most. And then you can transition to, you know, the mid market and eventually the, the best part of the market. So this is a path a lot of founders take. They start out with this small underserved market, the mom and pop, the SMBs. And we always, as investors, worry about people getting stuck there versus being able to move up market and service these larger contracts, which there's a lot of efficiencies of selling multi-million dollar contracts versus 5K annual contracts, which is probably about where your first one was. Um, but to do that, uh, like the business actually has to evolve, the product has to evolve. So 
since I know your business pretty well, I can think of some examples, things that you had to go do. Um, one of them is now you go put machines with your software inside of a practice. Um, and then uh, now you, you know, you're working on integrations with the largest medical records products, which is like a checkbox requirement for the largest players. They're like, we, you know, we need this integrated right into our system. And interestingly, there's a bit of a mafioso effect in play and we're gonna have to pay off some of these consolidator or these uh, software players to have access to their APIs and, and service this market, but it will unlock you know, multi-million dollar contracts. So you're about to get there. Um, Tom, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep digging on this technology a little oh, bit. Oh, don't I think do that, don't do that. I don't like talking. I, <laughs> well, you love talking about product. Yeah, product, product. Okay, yeah. okay. Not the underpinning, but the product, let's go. Okay. Um, so we were just talking about, you started out with this power data, but this yep. vision is to go much further. Can you tell us about, you know, basically where you're going with the, with the business? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so basically uh, where we're going and kind of how we see the vision. Uh, and the vision is important because that gets engineers excited, right? When you want to build a team, you want to have a vision. If you don't have a vision, it's really hard to get people around your idea. And it needs to be their idea too. And so our idea is basically to continue to build this global infrastructure intelligence. So whether it's power, which Matt alluded to, right, where a power issue or a fiber cut happens, we're able to deliver these insights. Um, I would just say that product is probably, it's, it's, so, it's so amazing because you, you get to kind of be around the table with a bunch of folks and, and kind of build the future. And so, and, and, and product is, is how you do that, right? You get to invent, you get to innovate, and then you put that in, into hands of individuals if, for our business to go partner with premier customers. And that's exactly what we focus on and only what we focus on. Um, but, and that's a big part of it, to be honest. That's how he knows everything about the business. Um, I, I mentioned this in a previous session, but, um, Tom's co-founder is this guy named Robin, and uh, you know they kind of fit this profile of the perfect founding team in my mindset, which is Robin is incredibly strong technically. You know he's the one ri writing copious amounts of code efficiently. You know with just a real passion. Uh, Tom, Tom is really strong on sales and, and customers, and then they meet in the middle of product, and this is what happens so much in these early stage software companies. Um, Tom, we were talking earlier today about uh, about your your path to growing this into a really big business, and I thought it was really interesting how you were talking about, you know, you have like a Fortune five, you have a Fortune fifty company, I think, maybe, yeah, yeah. Uh, as a customer, and you told me that you're going to go, you, you kind of profile your top twenty com uh, customers yep. and say, hey, they're spending this much with us now, mm -hmm. and then you're crafting solutions that um, lead to a certain dollar amount. Um, in the next several years. Can you talk about how you yeah. are mapping that? Yeah, totally. So we keep it super simple. We want to walk into any room and say, you put down a million, we're going to give you back 50, 50 X. That's it. That's what we build. And so like right now we deliver like an 18 X return. We have to improve that, right? 18 X is amazing, but it's, it's not world-class 50 X is 50 X is when you can walk into the, any room and you've earned the right to talk to that C-suite and say, Hey, you put this money down, we'll deliver that money back to you. And that is what we talk to our customers about constantly closing the cost savings gap. How can we use automation to provide this 50 X return? And with a limited team, we keep our team very small, very purposefully. You can only do so many things. And so there's a lot of things on the shelf that we want to do, um, but it needs to have, you know, it needs to, it, it needs to get to that 50 X. So the next thing that we're working on and what we're working on needs to be big. It needs to solve a massive problem. And for that, we obviously get paid and then we reinvest and take something else off the shelf and, you know, go do that. Jason, um, can you, share more about where you're seeing innovation and opportunity right now 
what kind of technology you use and industries are you excited about? I mean, we're seeing across the board, um, things are being rewritten um, in every industry. <clears throat> but um, at the, 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 the most exciting place where every industry is touching it now is AI. And you know, it doesn't matter which vertical, which horizontal, or which sector, somebody somewhere is playing with AI inside of that, those businesses. And um, some of these businesses could be disrupted by what we're seeing in AI, and some of them could just be augmented to um, 100x um, what their current businesses are. But there's not a there's not a company on the planet that is not f thinking about AI right now. So uh, the, the exciting revolution right now on AI is the language models. Are you could, are you comfortable telling like could you give like a short form of like how those are being applied to both text and image and Sure. I mean, the, what everyone has seen so far is what we call generative AI. So um, the two most popular are stable diffusion on the image generation um, and GPT or chat GPT from OpenAI, if you've, if you've all played with that. And both of those are basically just, you know, hey, give us a small prompt is what it's called, and we'll give you an output that matches that, and we'll generate that. The image ones are a lot of fun. So you say, like, create me... Uh, a lunar landscape with several astronauts, do it in an anime format, um, and you know, make, these, make them fighting on the moon type of deal. And like a whole bunch of different images pop out, and it's, it's really quite a bit of fun. Um, on the, the, the language side, the NLP side, it's, if you, it's all over the board. You, you, know, you could say, hey, write me a poem, or create a short story in the style of Alexander Poe, or um, Edgar Allan Poe, and you know, I want it to be about dogs and a nine-year-old girl. And like literally, it will go through and create a short story in that way. Now that's the fun side of it, but you're also seeing it applied very specifically. So think about like what UiPath, if you don't know what that is, but UiPath is a business automation product. Well, AI is now taking to the point where it will do all of these workflows inside of there and read the text coming out of Salesforce or this system or that system and say, well, here's what we think you should do next and it'll give you some of the output or just go and do that. And, um, you know, it's it's kind of a nuts phenomenon, to be honest with you, like what we're, how we're seeing it be applied. Um, so it could be all the way from, I use ChatGPT uh, over the Christmas break to write short stories every night for my kids. Well, or you could go and make a completely new programming model you know, start to finish. And if anyone here has not used ChatGPT to work on your startup from a code perspective, I suggest you go and try it out. You'll be amazed at what it outputs. Is that UiPath example live? Uh, there's a company called Adept, Adept that does that. So Adept uh, is a startup um, that basically is, is all about business automation using AI, yes. Mm -hmm. Are you an investor? Uh, no, I'm just friends with the founder. Okay. Missed that one. Um, I mean, we've been, we've, most people in venture right now are kind of say, this is amazing, amazing technology. And then we're all kind of thinking about like, well, where, where are the right investments to make? Um, I know you focus a lot on infrastructure. So are you seeing a lot of AI infrastructure opportunities? Yeah, we are. I mean, so I think of um, AI as infrastructure, language models as infrastructure is a good way to think about it, um, from, at least from my perspective. But also because of the uniqueness and, and the newness of the way in which you have to interact with these things, there's also new infrastructure being built around it. So one of the predominant way, uh, predominant uh, new changes is a new, brand new database uh, type entered the market called a vector database. So the way a language model works is you take all this data, like every data set on the internet, and you train this thing called a language model. But, and that is you know, semi-intelligent, but you also have a, a different way that you interact with these things called vector databases, which store these things called vector embeddings, and it speeds up the interactions with those language models. And it allows enterprises themselves to find what's called fine tune their specific data to interact with the language model so they don't have to give their data away to others. So that's just one example. But then, uh, so that, you know, a, a brand new database, brand new workflows, brand new storage engines, um, file types, all those things are emerging. Um, anything that you saw last way for cloud computing is kind of happening again for AI. Yeah, so I can talk about some applications that, that, that we're seeing. So um, oftentimes, like the advertising market, just because it's so large and um, it was sort of first to a lot of things, um, is the first to experiment with new technologies. So you have been the recipient of AI for a really long time. 
So the algorithms that dictate what you see on Instagram is AI. The uh, product recommendations you get on Amazon is AI. The recommendations on Netflix, your carousel, all AI, right? So like be one of marketing applications. Are those are language models? Uh, no, no, they, they're just like predictive algorithms. Yeah. Right, so V1 was predictive algorithms and the big companies are like really, really good at this stuff. They keep you in these apps, right? TikTok, so on and so forth. Um, we're now seeing the generative AI start to very quickly make its way into, into this market. And what's interesting is it's making its way into in, in, in basically two ways. It's num number one, um, removing people and processes from what are normally very manual jobs, very manual operations. So we've got a company in our, in our portfolio called Memorable memorable.io is the URL. Um, normally, if a marketer wants to build, um, build an ad and run it on Instagram, I mean, it can take like days and weeks, just like go through processes and people in black t-shirts are arguing and everything like that. With memorable, it's you use prompts. You say, I want basically what you just walked through, like astronauts on the moon with unicorns, so on and so forth. Build me an ad with that. They will do that and then run it through um, basically their core business, which is uh, you know, predicting um, what the brand lift will be. And a marketer can just use this and have a usable ad and understand if it's going to work against targeted audience in seconds. I mean, it's mind blowing stuff. And there's other applications of this as well. It's like, it's just changing everything fast. Um, funny adjunct to this. The CTO at Microsoft is a guy named Kevin Scott. Um, he it was the previous CTO at LinkedIn, was acquired into Microsoft. Before that, he was the CTO at, I think it was DoubleClick, who was acquired by Google. This, so this guy is obsessed with AI. That's the only thing he thinks about. It's the only thing he thought about at Microsoft. But it all started with DoubleClick. That's where he, he fully got into this and has been about that. And so he, for the past 15 years, that's all he's been thinking about. And now it manifests all the way through full cycle. I don't, you know, I don't know how many of you are feeling overwhelmed and kind of like, like I feel like there's a giant mountain rising around me and I'm like grasping for places to hold on. Like hey, it's the next platform. Yeah. We talked about this morning. It, it is you know, what, how, as big as mobile was, AI will be. Yeah. It, it's it, and it's you're just kind of it, what, one thing I've noticed is so many of my friends who are later in their career, like where we are, like 20 years out of college, they've done well. Like my friend ran all of ads for Facebook. You probably know Rob Goldman. Sure. Yeah. Um, he's hacking in his basement on new products. I told him like next time we go in there, he's going to have like a, a ne neck beard on the desk next to him, like doing, <laughs> you know, config files and stuff. I, I haven't programmed as much as I have in the past six months it's the same in, thing. In, in 10 years. This is, this is what happens. So everyone's playing again. It's much like whenever the iOS app store launched. Exactly. And everyone's like, oh, I can create all these cool things, flashlight apps and everything else. Now, um, it's, it's, everyone's hacking again. It's very, very exciting time. Um, okay, so I had one last question for Eric. Uh, no, I guess we kind of covered that. Um, so maybe it's a good time uh, to ask the audience their questions. And what I'll do is I will hand you the mic so I don't have to repeat your question. Um, so I have a question for you, Jason. Uh, <clears throat> when you uh, take a decision to sort of uh, uh, invest in a company, how much of it sort of depends on the charisma of the co-founders versus the market situation versus the merit of the idea? Um, so, so one of the reasons um, we invest the way that we do as a firm, and we have an IC, which is an investment committee with people um, across the firm, is so we try to, to take out a lot of emotion from an investment decision. So, you know, charisma of a founder, I might be sold on it, but, you know, several of my partners may be like, well, we're not going to have that discussion. We've got to talk about the merits of the idea, the merits of the business, and all that sort of stuff. So you try to even it all out. But there is, there is no denying that uh, the charisma of a co-founder or founders in a team can really help um, put you in the right state of mind to do that. There's just an infectious energies and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, you've got to, that's just one, one of a, of a bunch of different criteria in which you you need to to invest. So when you're writing a twenty, twenty five, you know, fifty million dollar check, it can't be on any one thing. It all has to line up. So you can have the most charismatic, but the business is doing this or the churns through the roof, and they can't, you know, they don't have a good answer for that. And you're like, you know, we're not going to invest in this. We might be wrong because maybe they'll turn it around, but it, it has to take a bunch of boxes when you're doing it at that level. 
the earliest stage, I would say a charisma and idea really matter a lot, though. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, I invest a lot, actually, on charisma, or what it relates to. And charisma can manifest different ways with people, but um, I see it as, is that somebody that I would want to work for, that other smart people would want to work for? You know, are they at least going to have a chance to rub sticks together and create a fire? Uh, and at the early stage, that's what matters most. Uh, this is for Tom. Um, you mentioned you have that uh, shelf of ideas that you want to pull from. And I can't help but think, uh, based on your experience with drone integration, do you see um, like infrared, ther infrared imaging and inspection, like just RGB inspections playing a role in your platform and how AI might play a role in that? And do you see that as one of those ideas on the shelf? Yeah, it's, it's, a, really, it's a really good idea. Um, so what I learned from the drone technology is that, uh, is that atoms and bits are very difficult to, uh, to, to work on, to be honest. Uh, and atoms are, uh, uh, so like uh, physical objects are much harder than like just computers. Right, so bits that come from SAS rather than like hardware. So maybe pulling that data somehow or from satellites, like I, I could probably see that. But yeah, it's like it's like the, I feel like um, starting out, and you're you're looking at ideas. Probably bits are easier than atoms. Is a is a thing that I learned, and I was like, uh, -uh. learned the hard way. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. Uh, this is one for Jason. So, um, you know, I've seen companies like Discord, you know, when they first started off, right? They didn't have like, they didn't really have a, a main business model, but they had a ton of users, right? <clears throat> especially in 2023, how do you view like startups that have like, especially SaaS startups that have a ton of users, right? But they don't have like a mainstream business model where, you know, they're not, they're not bringing any cash flow. How do you view companies like that? And do you personally invest in them? Um, so our, our main thesis when we say we invest in um, early growth is some form of validation. That's like key. It doesn't have to be revenue. It has to be some sort of traction, something that basically says there's signal here that something's about to break through. Um, so, so user validation, even in free, is, is good validation. And you can see that all the time um, in companies, though most companies do figure out a way to at least extract some dollars from their, um, their user base to a degree. But, you know, Heroku is an example. Heroku is a, was a, had a freemium model and only 4% of all users ever paid Heroku a dollar and yet it just crossed 500 million. And only 5% of all users ever paid GitHub a dollar and we just crossed, or they just crossed a billion dollars just recently. So if you think about the, just those numbers alone, so yeah, user validation. And I always have to say, because I've, I've grown up in a give it away for free and figure out how to monetize it world. Um, that's like how my mind tends to work. I said, listen, if you can capture all the users and you can't figure out how to monetize it, that's an us problem. So figure out if like, that's your game, like that's, it's a very attractive game. It's, it's hard to fight virality, you know. I want to remind the people on Zoom that they can ask questions, put them in the chat, and I will uh, come over to Matt and read them. But uh, until then, other people in the room? Eric, this is for you. You had mentioned that you, like, you have these ideas, and, but you need you need somebody to run with them. And so I'm really curious how you identify individuals that you might think are good for this idea. Um, are they people that, that you're already working with? Do you have this idea and think, hey, we need this kind of individual, let's go find them? And so thank you. Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, I'm old, right? So, so like I've been working for 25 years. Um, and over that time, you know, uh, I've had the benefit of, you know, just like working with a lot of people, meeting a lot of people, interacting with a, with, with a lot of companies. And I think that's, um, it's interesting because it's uh, my friend with the striped shirt here, blue uh, and red striped shirt. We were talking about like breaking into venture, breaking into startups or earlier, earlier on today. And, um, you know, like when you begin your career and you're, you know, sort of starting to specialize on one of these uh, frontier platforms and you've got some unique knowledge, uh, just getting out and like starting to build your network of uh, investors that are trying to understand these spaces, like specialists in, in investors um, or people at other companies and you know, so on and so forth. Like it's never too early to build your network 
start to network your way into interesting situations, build your reputation as somebody that like gets things done, is quality, and like you know, keeps in touch over the years, then opportunities are going to come to you. So quite frankly, it's people that I've met with uh, over the years, had good experiences with over the years, um, and sort of like stay relevant, stay, stay top of mind. I think that's great because frankly, anybody can do that stuff. And then we start to think about, all right, what are we working on? What's the like profile of the team that we think is going to bring this specific thing to market? But you know, it's typically people that are inside the network and not out because we're working on something and we're starting to assign you know, sort of like responsibilities to people that we know. That reminds me, I met my first employee at my first company because he started commenting on the blog exactly. that I was writing. Yeah, yeah. I encourage people to like reach out and like yeah, comment on posts, there. like reach out to VCs, just start to build build relationships because you never know down the line when it's gonna like turn into something. It might not, but it might. You might know some more about something than they do. Exactly. And we're like the, one of the best things about our job that I love is that we get to reconnect with people across this wide spectrum all the time. Like I was evaluating a company recently that sold into um, like material material haulers, like people like like Chemex, you know, or, or um, Semex, I should say, or, or people that are hauling gravel. And I like reconnected with a friend, older brother from high school. I hadn't seen the guy since we were 12 playing baseball. But, you know, I needed his expertise. This is what we do. All right, other questions? Uh, so I had a question on uh, finding uh, co-founders, and I think Chevy, for you, it was more of an organic process of sitting together with Penn Staters. But uh, Tom, uh, do you happen to have any advice on how you can find co-founders outside of your immediate space, and you want to find someone who's an expert at something and who's like globally good at it? Okay. Basically, how you found your Robin, essentially. Hold the mic up, Peter. Yeah, yeah. So, um, if I wanted to find someone, you know, and you know, a little bit of my journey is this, but so I can kind of maybe relate to that. But you, you want to look for someone who? Well, I just tell you, I'll tell you my, mine, right? I, I'm not gonna. Um, so what? What I did was, I you know knew people that could build, of course, um, but. In, in, in my area, I saw a, a guy who was running deliverability at one of the largest email service providers, and I said, okay, that kind of relates. And he, he, you know, he was still coding. I think that's really important, right? Uh, so he was still coding. And if I was looking for a co-founder, I would always look for someone who's still coding, maybe like a team lead. That's like really good, right, at another company. Maybe not a really large company, maybe a smaller company. And he also, you know, had the um, entrepreneurial tendency. So uh, AngelList, it's a really great place where you can kind of just look at source and then they used to give it away for free, but they don't, but you could then look at your area and then look at you know anyone that ever signed up for AngelList because, um, and then you could, you could actually look at like if they you know had done other things like, but because if, if they signed up for AngelList, they have some type of, spirit for entrepreneurship and you're not kind of guessing like linkedin where it's more professional so if i was going to go i'd go to angel list it's called well found i think now um but that is a very good place to go and uh yeah i would do that tom, tom was pretty methodical about what he needed yes if, if that's not clear like you probably did you originally find him on angel list yeah, I had a list of, you know, I build lists, right? So it's, I had a list of the top people that I thought would be the most amazing people if I knew them or I didn't know them. And I hadn't known him. So I reached out to him. I said, hey, uh, you up for a meet and greet? You know, just want to chat, tell you about this idea. And I'm also very big on visuals. So he definitely had to squint to see, but I was like, hey, listen, I kind of have this problem set etched out. I have these people that wanted and here's what I was able to do. And it's like, well, that's pretty bad, but I could do way better. And once you start having those conversations, you then can start seeing who has passion for it because what's going to happen is you are going to run into hard times and you just want a rider. Like you want someone who's going to be there. That's the most important, right? Brilliance is kind of like, you know, he, Micro Founder is really brilliant. Brilliance is like, you, you know, you're this smart or that smart. It's like, you know, there's no big difference. But someone who's going to ride, you know, that's, that's the big deal. 
the, and the last thing on this co-founder thing, you guys worked, to, he was still working a full-time job while you guys started just hacking on ideas together. Yeah, we were just hacking. We were just like, all right, let's, let's kind of, yeah, we, we did whatever we could, right? We, we really had passion for this and it took off. That's, that, that's my journey. These kind of little, but these, I see this is common. These like little trials, people do it nights and weekends. And somebody who's willing to put their nights and weekends into that instead of watching basketball, that's a good sign. Oh yeah, we were like, we were like, did, like lunch breaks, we would like, we would go, like he would go into his like car and, and put on his hotspot and code in his car. It was like unbelievable. And then we would do demos, it was, it was That's hilarious. what I'm talking about. Uh, I have a question for Tom. So like when you're starting out, you generally have a specific goal about what you want to achieve from your startup. But sometimes there are multiple avenues you can go down with that idea. So how exactly do you target what specific avenue you want to go down with the idea and what uh, overall basically what avenue you want to go with that specific idea? Because you have the solution in mind, you have everything in mind, but who do you want to target and what overall application you want to build for who? So the, the, the way I would answer that honestly is once you've done the research and the quote well, I did, right, the, like, and you've etched it out, it is not like a one through 10 thing. It is instinctual and you can only choose one thing. If you have three things, it's because you don't believe in the one thing. So it needs to be one thing. And that thing needs to be the real thing. And when you choose one thing, that's when you can move the world. That's when you can create the future. If you have three things, it's because you don't believe in one of them. All right, got it. Thank you. You pass it. Uh, also for Tom, just a quick question. So in terms of like what you were talking about before with facing like a potential hardship, which almost every for, uh, startup faces, how do you know when, um, you know, the time is in terms of pivoting or like knowing when to pivot versus kind of continuing through that hardship and just seeing your one idea uh, out? So that is the hardest question in startups. Yeah, that is literally the hardest question in startups. That is, a, that is a hard question. I gave it to you. Yeah, so I, mean, so I should just pass the mic. Um, no, I, I mean, I have an answer, but I just don't know. You know, I'm delivering, you know, the way there's two things. One, you do have to look at, you know, when you're older and in your quiet times, like, you'll think back. And it's just you writing and doing that journaling. And, you know, this is a framework that people use, but in your quiet times, should you have kept going? And if you're really quiet, you'll know the answer. But if you don't, the best way is to get perspective. So, you know, I, I'm blessed to have an amazing, you know, wife and awesome support system. And they're the people that will say, like, dig deep or let's talk about this. Good answer for the for the hardest the, the hardest challenge in startups right now. Um, this question could probably be for anyone. Um, uh, let's say you have one of these startups or one of these ideas that you are really passionate about. You uh, understand what your pricing structure is going to be. You understand that there is a market for it. It's at a small scale but you don't have the network that you guys have, what is your strategy, your for first step, or your plan to get these big companies or these big contracts or a, a bigger start than just something that um, is keeping you in that low, um, I forget the exact wording that we were using, but that low commercial space rather than that enterprise space. Well, I, I would say this, uh, that whenever you're building anything, uh, it's going back to instinct um, in quiet periods, but when you're, you, so you have to have some belief that you're gonna be able to do this and you have to have some instinct for the market and the customers. And I think a lot of times we focus on competition, but if you focus on customers and you understand that, like customers will actually tell you a lot of these times, but if you don't understand how to build a network, and that's specifically what you're asking about, um, I think there's there's several things to do. One is you don't have to build out the entire product along the way. You need to build enough of a like you know path through the product that it proves 
points along the way. Um, and two, you've got a reason why you start small is that it's less surface area to cover to prove those points. Um, you don't have to have all those various integrations and things of that nature. You can prove that this thing is valid um, and get the proof points, get the confidence to get that going. Those are also part of the network. They'll say, you should probably go talk to this or that or this person. Um, the other is uh, investors help a lot here. Investors can help extend your network and they can say, well, I'm gonna introduce you to a bigger firm or a big, or this person or, or that. And it usually only takes one person to unlock an entire market, which is a weird way that most software markets work or most um, sector verticals. You can, let's say you're going into health tech, there's always tends to be like one person who's gonna unlock or open up all these doors. And so while it's annoying to, to hear this as advice, you have to bang on a lot of doors, find that one, then you can get in and, 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 and do that. That's it's a lot of work, but this goes to like the general concept of networking, which is don't be afraid of a no. Like throw out a hundred random invites or blog comments, or blog comments or uh, Twitter replies or you know Reddit forum things or whatever. That like you just have to keep going out, and if it means cold emailing the VP of X company, um, just just keep doing it. Again, one one person saying yes is going to help there, and you never know where it's going to come from. I, I think that's when you hear the stories from very su successful entrepreneurs along the way. It's like, yeah, some random X, Y, or Z at time just happened to come in and I wasn't predicting it, but it just so happened because I was at a party or a, a person I was at a party with later introduced me to this other person. And so it just, it's constantly being out there. Uh, two tactical things that I've seen, Chevy, uh, I think you would say that going to these conferences has been huge for you moving up the value chain. It's every industry, especially B2B space, has conferences. Nathan, you're doing this too, building your startup. And you just go, put yourself out there, talk to lots of people, and then you get invited up to the suite with the food carts you were telling us about. A uh, little inside joke. Um, I want to pass back here and open for this. Yeah, so given all the craziness kind of going on with banks, namely SVB, uh, for you founders, how has that changed or how is it changing how you think about managing cash you've raised? And then for the investors, how does that change your expectations uh, for your founding teams once you've wired them the money? Well, uh, I forget what we use, but um, <laughs> uh, no, 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 I know the banks. <laughs> Uh, we're switching to switching to JP Morgan, I think. Um, no, we so we actually diversified our capital. Um, we we have a, so you know like the FDIC insurance. I forget what it's called, but most banks have a service or there's a sweep, sweep exactly. So we have a sweep. Um, so all of our cash is in different bank accounts, and there are services that will. Um, some people will give you some flack, some investors, because it's pretty. It takes time to manage those bank accounts. So like for instance, if you have payroll and it drops, you have to make sure you add the capital back. But there's many services that will manage that suite for you. I, I was going to say, from the investor standpoint, it's um, I mean, almost everyone in Silicon Valley used SVB to some degree. Um, but almost everybody also, if you're at a certain stage, did use sweep accounts um, or used a GSIB, a uh, globally systemic important bank, as well as SVB and others. So, but, but now treasury management will become an actual real thing that all uh, boards talk about, at least until we forget about it again in a year or two. <laughs> yeah, we, we, um, we, we created a set of guidelines for companies to think about and, and implement um, because, yeah, um, I, I used SVB for my fund and it was a very not fun weekend, um, not knowing like if our uninsured deposits um, of which it was significant, w were ever going to be like returned to us or, you know, the money that our investors had just wired to us for a capital call. So it was bad. Um, but for, uh, for startups, uh, I think it's, it was a good, like teachable moment um, in, in diversification. So our advice to startups is, um, you know, like two banks, ideally one money center that is a GSIB, right? So JP Morgan, where, you know, or, or something like that. City, Bank of America, so on and so forth. Maybe you know a more technology-focused bank, you know, for the day-to-day the -day stuff. Um, if you're contemplating non-U.S. Uh, commercial activities um, at some point, or if you are doing it, have a non-U.S. bank, um, and then uh, have uh, you know some sort of like uh, lending against uh, like accounts receivables, um, because venture debt is you know with SVB going away, you know it was a sort of big part of their business. Um, it's no longer a thing. 
Um, so sort of having diversification in terms of like your entire financial stack is going to be super important moving forward. Question over here. Um, this is for the investors. So VCs usually invest in companies for five or 10 years. Um, in the course of that time, people change, founders change. And so uh, I was kind of curious if, you know, only 10% of the startups actually make it. Um, how much of that is attributed to difference in the vision between the VCs that are on board member and founders and the diverging ideas that you know VCs and founders have so that you are into forced liquidation and stuff. So what percent of companies fail just because of that and how many are how many really change trajectories during those five, ten years? It's heavy. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, uh, so it's common to say that most startups fail because the founders get tired. That's a, like a thing that happens a lot. Um, and it's, I mean, it's true. It's a grind, right? But, um, but I would say that anytime you're creating something in general, it's a fight against entropy and inertia. Like the natural state of something is not for it to be created and to exist in the world. So you're constantly like, that's what you're doing every day when you're running a startup. You're, you're fighting its you know, something that shouldn't be alive in the first place and trying to create it. So he's constantly have to be putting energy back into the, the business and it does get tiring. Um, I don't think, I, well, I'm a VC at this point, that we're not attributable to any failures in the world at this point. No, no, um, but I think in general, what it comes down to is uh, to, founders do get tired. And I, and I think also that, um, you know, you're fighting the, the, the numbers. Something shouldn't exist in the world. 10% are the only ones that succeed and how many of them actually reach unicorn or decacorn status, I mean, that's even rarer. And so, you, you know, it's, it can't be attributable to any massive category, but I think that that's why we look for grit and grind and um, endurance and fast because they, we, you know, investors know that it's not gonna be a, a five-year bull market run um, all the time. It's gonna, you're gonna have years like this. Um, and that's also why the great investors take some time, gain perspective. What's your network look like? What's your support structures look like? How do you recharge? How do you do, um, can you take two weeks away? Can you do this? Like what, what does your executive staff look like? How much are you taking on versus delegating? Like there's a lot of stuff that goes into this. Um, but at the end of the day, like if the entire founding team leaves, what are the percent chances that a company is actually going to be successful before it reaches some escape velocity? Like that's a, that's a re you're fighting against all odds at that point. Yeah, it's, um, it's a super tough game, right? Um, and then on the other side, uh, that's where I think founders being thoughtful and um, having diligence on who they bring into their cap table, right? What investors they work with is super important as well, um, because the right investors. And you know, this is a, you know, it's a as we talked about this morning. It's like it's it's a big industry in terms of impact, but it's a small industry in terms of just you know like the total sizing, right? Two hundred billion, um, and you know just a, the the number of firms out there, and um, you know word, word gets around who is helpful in you know times of stress and time, time times of challenge and 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 who who is not um so leaning on you know other uh founders that you might know um to you know be thoughtful about who you partner with for the long term because if we do this it's for the long term that's super important as well so we are over time i want to thank the panel and all of you, thank all you. for being here enjoy the rest of startup week <laughs>